Welcome to Hariba's Raman Academy educational video series. My name is David Tuchel and I would like to address in some detail and answer the question why are the Raman spectra of crystalline and amorphous solids different? And to do that uh, we'll have to develop in some detail uh, the following topics. First present Raman spectra of crystalline and amorphous solids so that you can readily see uh, the differences in the spectra between these two materials where the principal difference is essentially the solid state structure and not the chemical composition. To understand these differences we have to develop some concepts and understandings of phonons both internal and external, the reciprocal lattice, wave vector, and the Brillouin zone, and from there uh, discuss the phonon dispersion curves for the Brillouin zone as a function of wave vector and crystal momentum. Then we need to begin to understand the phonon density of states within the Brillouin zone, and very importantly the conservation of wave vector and crystal momentum. This is absolutely essential to understanding why one sees Raman scattering uh, from crystals at only the so-called Brillouin zone center, uh, which uh, perhaps many of you have heard of, and that is uh, in a crystalline material only those phonons from the Brillouin zone center are Raman active. And so we'll cover phonons from the center to the edge, and then finally conclude with vibrational modes in amorphous solids. Alright, so here are spectra of similar if not identical materials. You've got, uh, in the case of quartz, they're the same. You see the Raman spectrum of crystalline quartz, which consists of very sharp, uh, narrow Raman bands. And uh, in contrast to that, look at the fused quartz, which is same chemical composition but a different solid state structure. It is amorphous, it is a glassy material. Consequently it does not have long-range translational symmetry and now as, uh, it is, as is sometimes said all the phonons uh, within the Brillouin zone become Raman active and are sampled. And so now we see Raman scattering uh, over a very broad range of wave numbers. And above that is a spectrum of a mater material that is different. It's a glass microscope slide, and yet because it's amorphous and has no long-range translational symmetry, we see again this manifestation of the lack of that symmetry insofar as uh, we see phonons from throughout the Brillouin zone. We see these very broad Raman bands. Now, here are spectra of the same material of silicon, however the difference is that in the lower trace you have single crystal silicon, cubic crystal, and so the, uh, uh, the one optical phonon that is Raman active at 520.7 wave numbers uh, is just a sharp single peak. Now, in the semiconductor industry, ion implant and ion implantation is used to introduce dopants to uh, this, uh, the semiconductor, in this case silicon, and uh, that is a process of ion bombardment of the dopants. Uh, they can be boron, phosphorus, arsenic, and if the flux uh, and the energy and the masses are all high enough, sufficient to disrupt, to break up the crystal lattice by this ion bombardment, one loses the long-range translational symmetry. So in this case, we see a Raman spectrum of silicon that's been implanted with arsenic at a very high dose, and so the crystal lattice has been entirely broken up, and so now what we get is a Raman spectrum that looks essentially like that of uh, amorphous silicon. All right, so to really understand uh, the Raman scattering certainly of the crystals, we begin by a definition of phonons. And phonons are defined as quantized vibrations of the atoms in a crystal lattice, and very importantly here, and are traveling waves. So unlike a local vibrational mode that you might be able to picture for a molecule, here we're talking about vibrations of the atoms 
throughout the crystal such that waves are propagating through this crystal associated with these vibrational motions and these are the phonons. The phonons are these propagating waves. And another important uh, aspect of this uh, definition is that all crystal vibrations, all of them, involve the entire lattice and are thus lattice vibrations, a term sometimes unfortunately only applied to external vibrations and such vibrations can be considered as a wave propagating through the crystal lattice. Now I'd like to expand on this a little bit because as Sherwood has noted it's a term sometimes unfortunately applied only to the external vibrations, that is to say in the low energy region of the spectrum. But as he differentiates uh, them is essentially as external vibrations and internal vibrations but they're all phonons. And what do we mean by these external vibrations? Well, in the low energy region, they can consist of translational modes. For example, uh, if you think of, uh, oh, let's say the 2D crystals, which are very popular these days, of molybdenum disulfate, for example, the transition metal dichalcogenides, where you have a layer of the transition metal and above and below it would be uh, the chalcogenide. So let's uh, take molybdenum disulfide, for example. So you have a layer of molybdenum atoms, and then above and below it, layers of sulfur atoms. Now you can envision these layers in shear modes moving uh, in a lateral motion uh, towards and away from each other. All right, and this is a lateral. This is a lateral motion, moving in anti-parallel motion we we would say then you can also envision these layers moving toward uh and against each other and these would be the so-called uh breathing modes all right so these are translational modes then you can also envision in for example a crystal such as lithium niobate uh, consisting of lithium atoms surrounding niobium oxygen octahedra you can envision these metal oxygen octahedra undergoing quasi-rotation about their centers of mass, the center of mass of these, uh, these octahedra. So these are the so-called external vibrational modes. Now within these, uh, uh, within these uh, atomic, uh, polyatomic groups, such as the niobium oxygen octahedra, you have vibrational modes that are uh, are so-called internal modes because those lattice vibrational modes are similar to but not identical to the motions of the isolated uh, octahedra let's say or tetrahedra depending on you know on what these structures might be so for example if you were to dissolve sodium nitrate or sodium sulfate in water you would find that there uh, functional, the polyatomic groups would uh, retain their functionality and so you would have nitrate and sulfate groups in, in the water and the Raman scattering that you would detect from those solvated species would be similar to, but not identical, to the, uh, the crystalline sodium nitrate and sodium sulfate. It's, and it's in that sense that we talk about internal vibrations being similar to uh, uh, the modes of just these polyatomic groups. And again, the reason why they're different in the solid state crystal from, let's say, the solvated species is because of the coupling between the groups. And so with that coupling, you have energy differences between those vibrations uh, in the crystal and those that you would uh, detect in the liquid or the vapor state. Now we have to further define these uh, phonons, lattice vibrational modes, as waves in a crystal from the repetitive and systematic sequence of atomic displacements. Right? We saw the uh, how they can be longitudinal, transverse, or some combination of the two. But we saw that these are waves, right? So therefore, they have to be characterized by a propagation velocity given by the letter V, a wavelength by the letter Greek letter lambda, or a wave vector K, the absolute magnitude of which is equal to 2 pi 
uh, divided by lambda, divided by the wavelength. Now this is a very important point here, it's because we're going to get into then reciprocal space and this is the reason why is because of the use of wave vectors in describing waves and the propagation of waves through, uh, a, through a medium. All right, and further to the description of the phonon, it of course has a frequency, a linear frequency, or an angular frequency, omega, uh, which is equal to two times nu, the linear frequency, and that's also equal to uh, the propagation velocity v times the wave vector k. All right, now just a pictorial description of transverse and longitudinal modes, right? So if we think about a monoatomic lattice and a wave propagating through it, we can think of either a transverse mode wherein the atoms in the top of this uh, slide are moving north and south uh, orthogonal to the direction of the propagation of the mode which is either to the left or to the right you can't really tell just from looking at this uh, at this motion that's a transverse mode a longitudinal mode consists of compression and rarefaction of the atoms as they move towards and away from each other in the same direction as the propagation of the wave all right, now let's develop the, uh, uh, the concept of a reciprocal lattice. And we begin by considering a real or primitive lattice, real or direct lattice, I should say. That's a primitive lattice consider consisting of essentially uh, one atom uh, per basis. And these, I'll use my uh, mouse as the pointer, as the cursor, uh, as a... Uh, a pointer here and you see in this real lattice that each of these black dots uh, is representing an atom in this linear crystal lattice and so the distance the bond distance if you will from one atom to the other which we'll describe by the letter A is then the basis vector of this primitive crystal lattice now from this primitive crystal lattice we can create a reciprocal lattice which you see below here which is simply the reciprocal of the direct or real lattice in other words we're plotting uh, we can plot 1 over a and uh, and then we would have repeat units of 1 over a 2 over a 3 over a etc as our basis but for uh, reasons of convenience which you'll see in just a little bit we will have as our uh, basis vector uh, 2 pi over a alright so our basis vector from an atom to the repeating unit in our reciprocal space is 2 pi divided by a that's the magnitude of the uh, of our basis vector and of course because of that this space from our origin, a, a, a lattice point or an atom, can be either pi over a or minus pi over a, and so that distance would also be equal to the length of, uh, of our basis vector. All right, well, what we've just done then is define in uh, what we call k space or wave vector space the first Brillouin zone and what we see is that if we now apply the uh, uh, the vibration of the atoms in this linear monatomic lattice we can describe that vibration and let's uh, let's define this vibration as a longitudinal mode where we have compression and rarefaction and we can describe that vibration through an angular frequency by the Greek letter omega with F as the vibrational force constant and M the atomic mass and without derivation of it I will just give to you the expression relating uh, the uh, angular frequency of this vibrational mode or this phonon if you will propagating through this monoatomic lattice as two times the quantity of 
the force constant divided by the mass to the square root times sine of the wave vector of the uh, of the wave of the phonon uh, times a divided by two. All right. Now, if you make a, then a plot of the angular frequency as a function of wave vector, you can see from this expression that it will reach a maximum when k is equal to uh, pi over a, because if we insert pi over a for k, then basically the a's cancel out and we're left with sine of pi half, which is 1, and so that is our maximum value. And what you then see is in this um, this plot of omega as a function of k, or wave vector, is a repeating function. And so within pi over a plus pi over a to minus pi over a we have our first what we call our first Brillouin zone and everything within this first Brillouin zone covers uh, uh, all of the symmetry elements which you can see at repeating units in our k space and going from pi a if we go now to 3 pi over a we've just repeated in essence uh, the first Brillouin zone. All right, so in this first Brillouin zone, uh, what I want to point out to you here too is the importance of the frequency as a function of k uh, and how that relates to the wavelength of this uh, of this phonon or this vibrational mode in a monatomic lattice. That is to say, remember that k, the absolute value of k, is equal to 2 pi over the wavelength. So what that means then is that lambda is decreasing with increasing k. So in other words, as we move from the Brillouin zone center to the Brillouin zone edge of pi over a, we are going to a uh, decreasing wavelength of, of lambda of the wave propagating through our crystal lattice. And so the, the longest wavelength is going to be essentially uh, at the Brillouin zone center where that would be equal to infinity. Now in the previous slide uh, we've been talking about a linear monatomic lattice uh, but in this case we're now changing things a bit and we have a linear diatomic lattice in this case with two atoms per unit cell. Now again I'm not going to go into the derivation of uh, how we arrive at the expression of the frequency in conjunction with the force constants and the masses. Uh, I, I could just refer you to books on solid state physics. What I do want to do however is to draw to your attention that by uh, creating this linear cell of uh, diatomic lattice. We now have instead of just the possibility of uh, of one frequency for a given k value, we now have two uh, possibilities in, in our expressions for frequency. And that's what you see in this uh, Brillouin zone uh, depicted here from uh, minus, uh, minus pi over 2a to uh, plus uh, pi over uh, over 2a. And um, so you see that we also have two what are now called two branches of uh, phonon branches of the Brillouin zone, the acoustic and the optical branches. And as a way of uh, getting an, an intuitive sense of the differences in these vibrational modes associated with these branches, you see on the left uh, some uh, moving images showing you the acoustic phonon branch of this diatomic lattice and you see that it looks very much like the one that we saw for the monatomic lattice whereas with the optical phonon branch you see atomic motions that are uh, let me say uh, now at a higher frequency and are therefore able to be excited uh, certainly in the infrared range uh, hence the term optical phonon branch, whereas the acoustic phonon branch 
the frequencies are so much lower. The important thing is that you recognize that as the uh, cell increases in the number of uh, uh, atoms per unit cell as well as the masses of those atoms you now have uh, increasing complexity of the available phonons in the, in the, in the first Brillon zone. Alright, so now what we want to do is to, uh, having established uh, hopefully some concepts about uh, K vector, wave vector, uh, reciprocal space, and the Brillouin zone, we want to go beyond the one-dimensional lattice and talk about a reciprocal lattice with the wave vector and the Brillouin zone, how we uh, produce these four uh, three-dimensional structures discuss then of course the phonon dispersion curves, phonon density of states, and uh, conservation of wave vector and crystal momentum. So here is how you construct a so-called Wigner-Zeitz primitive unit cell in real space. Now here what we're looking at is a, uh, a 2D, let's call it direct lattice, meaning in real space. So let's say these, uh, these uh, circles here represent atoms in real space and therefore in a lattice. And we will designate uh, this particular atom, you take any atom, but we take this particular atom as our central atom. And then the way to construct a Wigner-Zeitz cell is to essentially draw lines from that atom to all adjacent atoms in the cell. Uh, then at the midpoint between those two atoms, one draws a line that is orthogonal to the line connecting the two atoms and extend those lines. And then where they intersect forms the perimeter or the boundary of, uh, of a Wigner-Zeitz cell. Now if you do that, we've just done that in, in two-dimensional space, if you do that in three-dimensional space, here is an example of what one can see. So you've got in real space a uh, a conventional unit cell, body-centered unit cell, which uh, perhaps many of you are familiar with. You've seen it before and that would be the cell here uh, depicted by the atoms at the corners, atom in the center, and uh, extending uh, uh, beyond that cell, these would then be atoms at the at the center of adjacent cell. All right, um, to create a Wigner-Zeitz unit cell in real space from that, then you just do the same kind of procedures I just described in uh, the previous slide. Now carry that out in uh, 3D space so that what you then get is the Wigner-Zeitz cell that you see in, in, the, in the center. Now the same procedure that's used to uh, generate a Wigner-Zeitz cell in real space is used to construct a Brillouin zone in reciprocal space. So in other words, instead of starting with a lattice in real space, now what we're looking at is a, a 2D reciprocal space lattice. So in other words, instead of, uh, uh, say, our, uh, the distances between these uh, atoms points simply being, uh, let's say, A, referring back to our, our linear lattice in the, in the earlier slides, lowercase a, this would actually be uppercase a, meaning, uh, say, 2 pi over a. In other words, 2 pi over the bond distance. So now we start with a reciprocal lattice and then we carry out the same procedure connecting uh, points between a, uh, a center, we'll just select one atom at the center, extend lines from, uh, from that central atom to all the adjacent atoms, then establish lines that are orthogonal to those lines and then where they cross uh, that forms our perimeter uh, of the um, of the Wigner-Zeitz cell and therefore in this case because it's in reciprocal space it forms the perimeter of our 2D Brillouin zone. 
Now here we ended up with a hexagon because of the arrangement and the placement of these atoms, but if the atoms are placed or arranged somewhat differently, <coughs> excuse me, in the uh, in the reciprocal lattice uh, structure, uh, then you can get a, a different shape of that uh, of the Brillouin zone. And so just to be clear, what I want to show you here are constructions of the original crystallographic unit cell and the first Brillouin zones that were generated, just as I've shown you, by applying the wigner zeitz construction to the reciprocal space. So in other words, these Brillouin zones are not wigner zeitz cells of the direct lattice or real lattice, you first from the real lattice have to construct a reciprocal lattice from which then one constructs the Brillouin zone. So these are the connections here and you can see the correlations then of the Brillouin zones to the various type of uh, to the type of various type of crystal structures uh, in real space. Now here what we want to do is to examine a dispersion curve for a cubic crystal. And, in, and again, a dispersion curve is simply a plot of frequency. All right, you see this right here, the symbol here, the angular frequency uh, as a function of k. Or sometimes you will see the, uh, the symbol q in here uh, so instead of k for wave vector, you'll sometimes see the symbol q for crystal momentum. And the reason for that will become clear, I hope, in just a few more minutes. Now what you see here is the dispersion curve for germanium. Uh, and it is in the 100 and 111 crystal direction. So in other words, within the Brillouin zone, going from the center, to a particular face, a 100 crystal face or 111 face, as you progress through that Brillouin zone, what you'll find is that the frequency of the uh, of the wave vector through that Brillouin zone will vary from the Brillouin zone center to the Brillouin zone edge, which is at the crystal face. And notice too that we have not only a differentiation between acoustic modes and optical modes, but then we can get branching uh, here at the Brillouin zone center. Uh, this mode is uh, triply degenerate and so you uh, basically don't see any difference between transverse and longitudinal optical phonons. However, as you progress in K space towards the 100 or the 111 face, you see a splitting between the transverse and the longitudinal modes. And that's true for both the acoustic and the optical modes. Now here's a little more expanded and uh, I would say detailed uh, presentation of the phonon dispersion curve of germanium. And again, you see now, and we're using the symbols, the, uh, the Greek symbols that uh, are, uh, are typically used in solid state physics to define certain points in the Brillouin zone. Again, we're not going to go through that in detail. It's not the purpose of this presentation. But what I do want you to see, very importantly, is that at the Brillouin zone center, you've got, these are the, these are the frequencies at which one detects the Raman, spe uh, the Raman peak in uh, scattering from, in this case, crystalline germanium. And so you see that that peak is at about 301 or 302 uh, reciprocal centimeters. All right. And now as you uh, move through the Brillouin zone to different uh, positions and, and crystal faces, you see that the, the frequency uh, of that mode varies. Now what I particularly want to draw your attention to here is that you have a density of states. That's what DOS stands for. You have a plot of the density of states 
uh, with respect to the energies or the frequencies of these modes. So what this is showing you is that there are the, if you will, the population of states within the uh, within the Brillouin zone for uh, these different wave vectors. All right, so this this tells us that as you vary in frequency, the populations of the states at those frequencies are varying as well. This is going to become important once we uh, once we get into amorphous materials and we see the loss of translational symmetry, which then results in the breakdown of the selection rules, which in crystalline materials, I'm saying it again, restricts us to detection of only the phonon at the Brillouin zone center. Now, here is a phonon dispersion curve of silicon. And uh, as you might have been able to tell just from my changing the slide, it looks fairly similar to germanium. And it should, because it's isostructural. It has the same cubic, uh, cubic structure as germanium. However, because the masses and the force constants uh, differ, you, uh, you now see that at the Brillouin zone center, the, uh, the frequency for crystalline silicon is at 520 wave numbers, not at the, the 301 wave numbers, 301 wave numbers for crystalline germanium. And again, you see that the density of states for silicon is quite similar to that which we see for germanium. So looking at them together, uh, I hope you can see my point. And so the structure is what dictates the, um, let me say, the, the relative uh, energies or frequencies of these modes, but the absolute frequencies or energies of the modes are essentially going to be dictated by the, uh, in this case, principally the mass because the force constants are uh, uh, are similar. And you see how the densities of states for germanium and silicon look pretty much alike. Now we turn to the important topic of conservation of wave vector. And so what you see here is a wave vector diagram of the Raman scattering event in a crystalline material. So we have the wave vector of our incident photon, that's K sub i, and upon interaction with the crystal you have a scattering of the uh, of the photon, that's uh, a, a scattered photon, which is the one detected by your spectrometer, and we'll indicate that by K sub s, and the creation of a phonon okay or some times people refer to it as the launching of a phonon and that's Q and so in order to have conservation of wave vector K sub I right the incident photon has to be equal to K sub S the wave vector of the scattered photon and Q the wave vector of the phonon and what you should notice here too is that there is a directional dependence of the phonon with um, with the angle at which you're collecting the Raman scattered light. So in other words, if you uh, if you were to collect at 90 degrees scattering geometry, then uh, this angle of the propagation of the phonon would be at 45 degrees. And in fact, there is such a thing uh, as uh, phonon directional dispersion. It's called in which uh, one can find that the energy of the phonon depends very much upon the direction of phonon propagation within the crystal and this is particularly true for uniaxial and biaxial say ferroelectric crystals and piezoelectric crystals uh, but again that's beyond the scope of uh, the scope of this talk well let's rearrange that expression to put the uh, the phonon wave vector on the left side of the equation, all right, which is now equal to k sub i minus k sub s, and referring again to the same diagram, what this tells us then is that uh, q is equal to 2 k sub i, 
And the reason that we say 2K sub i is because uh, essentially the uh, uh, the wave vector of the incident and the scatter light are uh, we will say are approximately equal uh, and then that function times the sine of the half angle all right or the, the or essentially the angle of uh, of our phonon all right so that being the case what that means then is if our angle uh, is uh, is zero degrees. So in other words, we're detecting forward Raman scattering, then we have, by this definition, we have a wave vector of zero. And as we as we change the dire direction at which we happen to be collecting the, our Raman scattered light, and let's say we, we move our lens over to 90 degrees, now that means that this uh, this phonon traveling at a, a 45 degree angle is going to have a value of 1.4 times k sub i and the uh, if, if we have backscattering geometry in other words k sub s is essentially equal to minus k sub i then what you end up with is uh, a phonon with uh, a wave vector value of two times k sub i. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because energy and momentum and momentum are conserved in the Raman scattering process involving real crystals, which are anharmonic. Therefore, the crystal momentum is generated, that's, that's the momentum that is taken up by the crystal, it's generated from the incident radiation in the crystal through the creation of a lattice vibrational mode or this traveling wave or this phonon right? so the incident photon delivers momentum taken up by the crystal and then uh, it has to be conserved in both the scattering wave vector and the phonon wave vector All right. so the expression for the momentum is just h bar times k and so the momentum for the uh, for the crystal is uh, h bar times q. Now, as we were describing on the previous slide, you know about the for different configurations, then you can see with this vector diagram, if the uh, if the incident light is propagating in this direction, here's the the wave vector for the incident light, and if we're detecting light at 90 degrees then we can determine our Q value uh, just through this vector diagram by a vector uh, traveling from the end of K sub I to the end of K sub S. Now we can reduce that to uh, the following expression uh, for uh, uh, this triangle for these uh, uh, this particular diagram in the general sense where q squared is equal to the incident wave vector squared plus the scattering wave vector squared minus 2 k sub i k sub s times cosine theta. Now the, I mentioned this on the previous slide the frequency of the scattered radiation is approximately equal to that of the incident radiation that is your incident radiation you know, in typical visible light is about, let's say for example, 20,000 reciprocal centimeters. And given that your Raman scattering is uh, in the hundreds of wave numbers, that's significantly less than the inc that of the incident radiation. And so we will make the approximation and say K sub I is approximately equal to K sub S. And so what does that mean? That means f that Q, the phonon, is approximately equal to 2K sub I for the 180 degree backscattering configuration. And how do we get that? Well, you've got K sub I squared, and let's uh, call this then K sub I squared, so that's, and then we have minus 2K sub I squared cosine theta. Well, cosine of 180 degrees is minus 1, so you have 1 plus 1 plus 2 
ki squared, uh, I'm sorry, 1 plus 1 is 2, plus 2 ki squared, that's 4, and the square root of that, of this whole expression then is q, is equal to 2 k sub i. Now, 2 k sub i, remember that k is equal to 2 pi divided by the wavelength, lambda. So if we substitute that in here, then we get what we get is 4 pi over lambda, which is equal to the frequency divided by the speed of light, uh, and that's equal to uh, 4 pi times the wave number, or nu tilde. Right? So that here we re have reached a very important point here, that the phonon is essentially equal to 4 pi nu tilde. That's certainly true in the, in the backscattering configuration. So, having established the conservation of wave vector and momentum, and specifically the expression for the backscattering configuration. You could do this for other configurations, in which case you include the uh, sinusoidal function in here, but for convenience we use just the backscattering arrangement, which is uh, uh, of course the one for micro Raman spectroscopy. What do we have? We have that the the phonon uh, Q is equal to 4 pi nu tilde. All right. Well, blue-green laser light, that's actually, or approximately, I should say, around 20,000 reciprocal centimeters. And we've established that Q is equal to uh, 2 k sub i equals 4 pi nu tilde. So we, it, we substitute uh, 20,000 reciprocal centimeters for nu tilde. And our uh, phonon, then, or uh, our phonon wave vector then is equal to uh, 2.5 times 10 to the fifth reciprocal centimeters. Now here's where we connect this to the Brillouin zone and the uh, lattice spacing of a Brillouin zone and the reciprocal space of the Brillouin zone. The Brillouin zone edge is at pi over a. Remember that. And so if we assume a lattice spacing of say three angstroms, then a is equal to three times ten to the minus eighth centimeters. So our wave vector, our k value at the Brillouin zone edge is then going to be equal to pi over a, which is pi divided by three times ten to the minus eighth centimeters, which turns out to be approximately one uh, well, uh, equal to, if we round it off to one significant digit, 1 times 10 to the 8 reciprocal centimeters. This is an important uh, conclusion we've come to here. That is, there is a difference of three orders of magnitude between these values, between uh, the k value at the Brillouin zone edge and the actual phonon uh, that can be sampled because of the laser light that we're using. So you've got a difference of three orders of magnitude. Therefore, only the Raman scattering from phonons of a very long wavelength that's going to be equal to several thousand atomic spacings and very small k value near the Brillouin zone center out to about 2.5 times 10 to the fifth reciprocal centimeters will be probed. Because remember, as you increase k, you're going to shorter and shorter wavelength. As you decrease k, you go to longer and longer wavelength. So, in order to conserve wave vector and conserve momentum, we are then restricted, in the case of a crystal lattice vibration, to being able to probe only the Brillouin zone center. All right, so. Let's conclude our uh, talk by discussing these final topics then. Phonons from the Brillouin zone center to the edge and vibrational modes in amorphous solids. So as we just pointed out, and I'm using this two-dimensional reciprocal lattice rather than three-dimensional to, uh, to, to help envision what's taking place here, is that when performing spectroscopy at 
the kind of wavelengths that we use, either in the infrared or to the visible, we are essentially restricting ourselves to k values, wave vector values, that are very small or very much near the center of the Brillouin zone. Now the only way to be able to probe spectroscopically phonons of different wave vector, the kinds of phonons that we saw in the dispersion curves and for those densities of states, is if we were to use uh, excitation wavelength of uh, that is much shorter than what we use in the infrared or the visible. And it turns out that uh, inelastic neutron scattering does uh, fill that uh, requirement, does meet those conditions. And so when uh, you happen to see a, let me say, a spectrum from neutron scattering, instead of just sharp peaks, what you'll be sampling is the entire Brillouin zone. And in fact, that is how densities of states are confirmed by obtaining essentially vibrational phonon spectra from inelastic neutron scattering. And then of course, if you have really short wavelength, then you get out to the point of diffraction uh, of the crystal lattice, which of course we're not going to go into here. Now, we've just established why it is that one can only see the uh, Raman scanning from the Brillouin zone center in crystalline material. What happens when you lose that long-range translational symmetry? as we saw in the case of glass or, uh, say, uh, ion-implanted silicon. Well, in an amorphous material, the observed Raman bands are no longer associated with traveling waves nor wave vectors and are technically, therefore, no longer phonons. One detects scattering from, essentially, from local vibrational modes of these materials. Now, what's important here is the term phonons and my definition of it here, and it's a definition shared by, of course, many people, you find this in, in textbooks, and that is the term phonons as defined as lattice vibrational waves. It's still used for convenience in describing the vibrational modes of amorphous materials because the phonon density of states corresponds to the Raman spectrum. In other words, one might say that the entire Brillouin zone is now sampled in an amorphous solid. So in other words, you lose the long range translational symmetry. And so now all these things that we've been talking about in terms of conservation of wave vector and momentum, they no longer apply uh, because you, in essence, don't, uh, don't have that wave vector uh, as defined by the crystal lattice. So, in an amorphous solid, contributions from the entire phonon density of states appear in the first order infrared and Raman spectra. And that's taken from the fine book by Richard Zallin, uh, The Physics of Amorphous Solids. And then finally, that the short range order and chemical bond interactions manifest themselves in the Raman spectrum. So, in other words, you have all of this disorder, you have certainly different bond angles in, uh, in an amorphous solid and perhaps even uh, differences in bond lengths. Hence you have all of these different uh, oscillators, if you will, at uh, different frequencies and energies in that solid. So again, returning to our phonon dispersion curve of silicon. As I said, we're now able to sample the entire Brillouin zone. So, not only are we sampling phonons at this particular frequency, at the Brillouin zone center, but at all these other frequencies within the Brillouin zone at the, at, at the, at the various positions. Here, and I'm pointing to the, to the optical modes, and down here for the, for the acoustic phonons. And then, the, as we're able to sample those, it turns out that this density of states for the phonons described in, for a crystal lattice uh, is manifest then in the Raman spectrum 
of the amorphous material. So here you see from a paper by Smith and co-workers uh, generated, uh, well published back in 1971. So in the upper trace what you see are, are Raman spectra of amorphous silicon acquired at 27 degrees Kelvin and at 300 degrees Kelvin but because there's no long-range translational symmetry you see a spectrum that looks very much like uh, uh, the uh, ion implanted silicon spectrum that I showed earlier. In, down below in frame B of this figure what you see are the calculations of the phonon densities of states that were uh, uh, that were presented in this publication the uh, the dotted line is of their uh, shall we say their very explicit calculations of the density of states to which they added uh, some broadening in their functions uh, as it says here described in the text and that you see in the uh, in the solid line and you begin to see how that by having done that you uh, see that that density of states looks a lot more like the amorphous silicon spectrum so if we compare that to uh, the um, the spectrum or spectra that I showed earlier you see again the Brillon zone center is all that's being sampled in single crystal silicon because of the need to conserve wave vector and momentum and we're only sampling that K value, that wave vector or Q vector, crystal momentum near the Brillon zone center so I only see that one frequency at 520 reciprocal centimeters. Once once that long-range translational symmetry has been lost, uh, all of those principles associated with the reciprocal lattice are now gone because there is no reciprocal lattice. And so now we essentially uh, are sampling all of these modes and as we see what are called all of the modes within the Brillon zone, not just the Brillon zone center, and that is the reason why the spectra of the ion implanted silicon looks so different from the single crystalline silicon. And likewise, where we started, the difference between the spectrum of crystalline quartz and these amorphous materials. So let's conclude then by what I hope was uh, a detailed and hopefully not too painful uh, description of what is behind the Raman scattering of crystalline materials and why they differ so much from what we see in amorphous materials. What we have are energy and momentum are conserved and the Raman scattering process is involving crystals which are anharmonic. Therefore, as a result of their being an anharmonic, crystal momentum is generated from the incident radiation in the crystal through the creation of a lattice vibrational mode that travels through the crystal, that's a phonon. Only phonons of a very long wavelength equal to several thousand atomic spacings and therefore very small K values near the Brillon zone center will be spaced. Remember, K is equal to 2 pi over lambda. So in other words, in order to get to the K value that we calculated, for our incident laser light we would have to have uh, these several thousand atomic spacings. And finally the term phonons as defined, and this is very important, we're defining phonons as lattice vibrational waves. It's still used for convenience in describing the vibrational modes of an amorphous solid. And the reason we continue to use that term phonons is because the phonon density of states of a crystalline material uh, corresponds so well to the Raman spectrum. So that is the underlying basis for uh, one saying that the entire Brillouin zone is now sampled in an amorphous solid. I want to thank you for your attention 
And if you would like uh, more information about uh, this topic or any other topic, please feel free to contact us at the telephone number below and at the uh, websites uh, shown below as, as well.